Okay, so good afternoon and welcome. It um, always intrigues me that uh, after 15 years of working in division land and general practice and um, wherever, that people still come to workshops around MBS item numbers. And um, it, it also intrigues me that it is probably one of the driest and most boring topics that anyone can present on. So, um, hence why I choose and, and thank heaven I have a, um, a colleague, Cathy Godwin, who's going to help me today, um, hence why we end up presenting it. See if we can do a bit of light relief. Um, I want to know why you're here. Why have you come to an MBS? Yes, Jane? I come to see you perform. <laughs> I'm not performing today. I'm way down on the energy levels today, but I'll do my best. By the way, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, they wanted to mic me, and I warned them that if they mic me, they'd get a lot of feedback. So as long as you can hear me, that's the main thing. Yeah, no, seriously, why have you come? Five months. Give her a clap. Welcome aboard. It's great to have you in the troops. Let's hope you're here in 15 years' time. I won't be, but you might still be. Another reason, yeah? I work independently. Yes. And local GPs subcontract Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Did you all hear that? Basically works independently and takes a proportion of what you earn. One of the first notes that I think you should write down on your paper is if you're employed by a general practice is to continue to consider negotiating under your contract to get a proportion of what you earn. Because the next thing I want you to do before we get started is to write down on a piece of paper what your hourly rate of pay is. Sit there by all means, mind. Yep. What your hourly rate of pay is. No one's going to see it. Just write it down on a piece of paper now. I'm hearing at the front that someone doesn't know what it is and that just sends shivers down my spine. Except the nurse contract is probably okay there, Liz, because she, it just depends how much she does, I guess. I want to know what your hourly rate of pay is. I don't want to know what it is. Well, you can write that. Yeah, you can write that down if you like. Um, they're not free, are they? No. Okay, ladies, if you can join that table there, that'll be great. Now I want you to write down on a piece of paper what I think, what you think you should get as an hourly rate of pay. What do you think you deserve? I don't care if you're permanent, part-time, casual or permanent. What do you think you deserve? Well, I think they deserve a minimum G, five dollars an hour. And what currently is the average rate of pay across Australia for a nurse in general practice? Does anyone know? Jane? Shush. Does anyone know? It's a bit higher than that now. We're up on the 31 to 32 mark, all right? So if you're not getting 32 bucks an hour, if you, if you, in that first number you wrote down, that concerns me even more, all right? So what we're going to try and do this afternoon is that I'm going to try and motivate you, make you proactive, start thinking about what you're worth and how you can generate it. Cathy is then going to give you some overview of how you can use item numbers, etc. And then I'm going to finish it off by giving you some more strategies about how you may be able to negotiate and generate um, and aim for what you think you're worth. Is that okay? So this is what... Um, I just wanted to give you some feedback that we were actually asked to do this workshop. This workshop um, came about as a condensed version of a two-day workshop that we did in Melbourne and Queensland around item numbers and whatever. So there is no way this afternoon 
probably in your case that we're going to be able to cover a whole stack of item numbers, right? What we're hoping we'll be able to do is let you see some opportunities to actually think about um, what it is that you're doing, what you're generating and therefore maybe what you're worth. Um, they wanted us to give a bit of an overview on who we were and the big question is this, guess which one's the older person in this photo? <laughs> because I don't think I've ever met two people that look quite so much alike. Um, that was taken 10 days ago when I was in Cambodia and uh, uh, hence why I'm not real well. I think I've bought every bug that Cambodia had to offer back with me. I was great while I was in Cambodia but I'm not real good at the moment. So um, my background is nursing, it's uh, starting in divisions in 1998 and I was privileged enough to be involved in um, the beginning of the nursing and general practice program and then managed the nursing and general practice program in New South Wales for five years and for the last four years I've been working privately as a private contractor like you, mainly doing education and training around all things general practice basically. So that's me and then there's Cathy. Hi, I'm Cathy Godwin. Um, I live on the south coast of New South Wales. That's the <coughs> beach just down the road from me, so when I'm home I feel like I'm on holidays. Um, it's my community and the passion for uh, improving the health in our community. We're in a rural area and whilst it looks beautiful, the pristine sands of Jarvis Bay, um, the harsh reality is it's a low socioeconomic area. The patients that we serve are um, really desperate for health care. We're the only bulk billing practices, so we look after 25,000 patients. Um, I'm a practice nurse. I've been practice nursing now for 11 years, and um, I've grown to be a strategic manager as well. So I do all the clinical business development, identify opportunities. Every time there's an opportunity, I grab it. So I'm hoping to impart my passion to you guys today. Uh, a bit like my brother, he's passionate for the cats and uh, he'll watch them day and night and I'll, uh, yeah, I'm quite passionate for primary health care. So some of you may have seen me around before. Um, for those that haven't been to a conference, these are fabulous opportunities for us to grow professionally and learn from each other and that's what we're going to do today in this workshop, okay? Because, you know, whilst I might be an expert in my area, everyone <coughs> comes from different places, yeah? We've got many from remote areas here today. Yeah, welcome. Uh, and rural areas, uh huh, and urban. So, okay. So, I look forward. We've got a pretty good little spread going here. So that's going to be great. We're all going to learn from each other. So, thanks, Liz. Okay. So let's. We wanted to start off by giving some thought to how to work strategically within your practice using the Medicare item numbers. And I guess one of the roles that I play quite often is that of devil's advocate, is to actually to think about how you strategically in your practice determine what it is that you will do. So who decides what item numbers you are going to focus on? Who decides which ones you're going to do in a private contractual point of view? Or who decides where they the think the money the is and whether you're actually only un undertaking activities to earn a, you know, an extra dollar for the practice. So who does that in your practice? Hands up those of you who are responsible for identifying those opportunities to do Medicare item numbers. Hands up those of you who's told where they will focus their approach to the um, uptake of item numbers. Hands up those of you who really don't know. Hands up those of you who actually are aware that you're undertaking item number activities. All right. Hands up those of you who aren't aware. So we're still doing the nursing role that is about triaging and seeing whoever walks through the door. Am I right in assuming that all of you at some stage are doing 721s, 723s, 715s, whatever? Is that correct? No, no. some of you aren't. All right? What's okay. <laughs> Let's just, before we get started, do a little test. 
This is a list of Medicare item numbers that you should all know off the top of your head. And if you are thinking proactively about where you want to be as a practice nurse, and particularly if you want job satisfaction, then my belief is that you should know the role that you play in regards to patient care. We got any more? We've actually got a few more people than we anticipated. So, has anyone else got? How many do we need? You want one? No? Have we got one up the back here? You haven't got one either. Oh, so where, where are you? Oh, we're a Medicare local, right? All right. If you work at a Medicare local, you should know those as well. Because right now. No cheating, Jane. Yeah. Okay, well, I was just hoping she could give me some clues. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to give you some clues. I wasn't going to do that one first, but... <laughs> hmm? You started on time, so you mm -hmm. say... We've got... We've got of you just went snack? Yep. How many of you have got 15? How many of you have got 15 descriptors? Some of you I know have done this before. Sorry? Um, we're a new practice at SA Health, so we haven't done... Haven't done... No. Alright, let's leave it at that. How'd you go? Did anyone get to 15? Let me ask you this. In your role as general practice, am I right in assuming most of you are working as practice nurses? Is that correct? Is anyone? Someone else is working at Medicare Locals, is that right? Medicare Locals, alright. What is your role at the Medicare Local? Sorry? Care coordinator. Care coordinator. Right, okay. Care coordinator. So is there an expectation in that role that you will have a vague idea how general practice works? Okay. Is that correct? So am I right in assuming that? Okay. So to me, if you're going to know how general practice works, and let's cut to the chase, general practice is small business. If they don't make a buck, they don't keep the doors open, they don't turn the lights on and the telephones don't work. And what's more, they don't pay your wages, all right? So if you're working at a Medicare local as a practice support person, or if you're working as a nurse in general practice, and you like that job that you've got, then to me, it makes good sense to keep the lights on and the telephones going, and to make the role as satisfying and, and, and as exciting as you can. Is that something that, 
you know, is that a belief or am I barking up the wrong tree here? Okay. If any of you get the opportunity to, to look at your role in general practice and whether you're working at the advanced level or then whether, you, whether you're working in a leadership role, then my observation would be that those people who do that often have job satisfaction and in actual fact are often proactive, not reactive. Right? You can be reactive within your job by being told what it is you can do. Now, as nurses, we are highly skilled. And in general practice, it is a generalist role that encumbers a number of things. And if I have a choice, as I have, then I've chosen the bits that I like doing. And I know the bits that I like doing, I do better than the bits that I don't like doing. So therefore, to me, if I'm working in general practice and I've got an opportunity to choose some of the activities that generate income to keep the lights on, then I'm going to choose the activities I like best. Do I like indigenous populations? Yes, I do. Do I like the oldies? No, I'm a bit sick of them between you, me and the gatepost because I worked as a community health nurse for 15 years. You know, I'm a bit over them. And what's more, I've got a 92-year-old dad and I had a mum who lived with me for 10 years. That was enough, right? Do I like kids? Yes, I do. Do I like adolescents? I love them. Do I like sexual health and women's health? Yes, I do. Do I like wound management? Don't want to see another ulcer as long as I live. Right? So for me, if I'm working in general practice, I'm going to go step by step and work out what it is I like, what it is that the practice presents, and what it is that mutually we can do together to benefit one another. So how many of you have actually looked at the data and the demographics of your practice? Yep. How did you do it? Pen tool? Using the pen tool. How many of you know what cleaning data tool you've got on your computers? First step, homework, write down, back to the practice, what data tool have we got on our computers at work that help us cleanse our data and can identify for us our cohorts of population with whom we deal with? It's really simple. And if you don't know how to do it, then I tell you, your Medicare local does. And you should become intimate with your Medicare local personnel. They should be your very best friends. And if you're the Medicare local staff, you should be the practice's very best friend. And I find that coffee and cake always works wonders. <laughs> All right? So to me, have a look at that cohort. They will tell you whether you've got an aged population, a family population, a kids population, and Kathy's going to go into more. Have you got a large diabetic population? Have you got a large COPD population? These are the sorts of things that you can identify and go, don't mind doing diabetes, don't want to do COPD. How can I utilise the item numbers that are available to us and have job satisfaction as well as generate an income for the practice, right? Because my observation has been, because I've been around long enough, is that we have had so much change over the last two, three, four years within general practice, particularly in regards to item numbers, etc., that practices are struggling to hold their head above water. And I believe it's an ideal role for the nurse to go, what do we focus on? What do we do well? What can we say to our populations about we will actually make a health outcome difference? We won't just do over 75 health assessments because they generate 256 bucks. We will actually do them because we've actually got a strategic approach to what happens when we come back from having done that. We have a referral pathway when we identify who we need to refer to. We ensure that all our over 75s have an HMI are completed. It's part of the process. It's not just the generation of the 250 bucks. 
we've got a cohort of diabetics in our population that actually looks at the number of diabetics we've got. Now, everybody says to me, yep, we're, we're going to do the diabetes stuff. We've all got GPMPs, TCAs on our diabetics. Yep, we're doing that. What difference have you made to the diabetics? What difference has it actually made to their health well-being? Sorry? It should be bringing down their HbA1c. It should be bringing down their HbA1c's. Deborah, you're a marvel. Do you want to come and do this? This is exactly what they should be doing. So to me, if you're looking at diabetics in your practice, and I promised you resources, so I'll give you this one in a minute. It's a diabetic pathway. What you should be doing is going, let's look at the cohort of diabetics in the practice and who are we going to focus on? Are we going to do type 1 kids? Are we going to do type 1 adolescents? Are we going to do type 1 adults? Are we going to do type 2s? Are we going to do all our type 2s? Are we only going to do our type 2s with HbA1c's over 8? Who are we actually going to do? And who can we actually make a difference with? And my observation has been that most of you, if you're in reasonable size practices, will have in the vicinity of probably about 150 to 100 patients with HbA1c's over 7.5. That makes good sense to me, particularly if they're still on oral medication. Because wouldn't it be beautiful to measure within a 12-month period that you actually did 721, 723, 732s and the 2517s, note I'm wrapping off these numbers, you've got to know them, that in actual fact at the end of 12 months says we saw 50 of those and their HbA1c's have actually reduced to now 7. That is really good. 2517, it's on your list. What's a 2517? Pardon? A SIP. And what SIP is it? Diabetic cycle of care. At a level B consult. All right? Okay. Now, I'm purposely going to rattle off numbers, and I'm sure Kathy will too, and I'm not going to fill them in, and I'm not going to give you the answers. Because the homework from this workshop is that you're going to go to MBS Online, my favourite, God, I've got a boring life, <laughs> website, <coughs> and Google those item numbers, and they will give you very clear descriptors of what they are. It will tell you what you have to do. And for the Medicare local people, you should know them like that. And you should be able to go, right, if you do a 721 and a 723 and a 732, you can actually do a 2517 at the same time after the 12-month period. Bamboozle them with science. So that's a bit of your homework. Fill in the rest of the numbers. They are the most popular item numbers that are used in general practice. The first four have got nothing to do with you at all. They're GP item numbers, consult item numbers, right? And in fact, nursing time does not come in at all to those four item numbers. You can't count nursing time in those four item numbers, okay? So the other thing I want you to think about is how do you strategically, if you're going to start to do approach to general practice, bearing in mind that what I'm telling you is to encourage you to undertake activities that have the potential for you to get the impetus and the way with all to go and say, I need more money, I, earn, and I can earn more money. How do you strategically involve everyone in your practice in regards to the implementation of item numbers? How many of you use your front desk as an opportunistic um, approach to identify when you could actually pick up item numbers. Yep. What, tell me what the process is. What does your front desk staff do? Sorry, the sun is just they, right behind you. They might be checking something in for immunisation, for a four-year-old immunisation. Yes. The first thing they'll ask is, have you had the three-and-a-half to four-year-old health check? So that's part of their role. Um, they might be booking somebody in for something with the nurse or the GP for a flu shot. 
ten minutes in the nurses' room. We sit down and give them the flu shot in the ten minutes that I want them to be with me for the reaction time. I sit down on the computer, I check what they're up to, and I can do seven three two. I can coordinate their care. I can find out have they been set by a patient. Have they why not the start of us? So you are using your front desk class as an opportunity. Okay. Yep, yep, yep. Excellent. My belief is that we do not use, sorry, our reception staff to the best of our ability. Now, the challenge for you is, of course, is to encourage them to become part of the team to actually be involved in patient health outcomes. We haven't got time today to talk about evaluating your patient health outcomes. How many of you, as we said, actually evaluate what it is you do? At the end of 12 months, actually look at how many of your patients you've actually reduced the HbA1c's on. How many of you actually do that? Because we all get caught up in the cycle of just, you know, they come in the door, let's deal with them, the doctor says, let's do this, let's do that, and we send them on their merry way. So, what I've developed, we said we'd provide you with resources. This is the front desk sheet that I believe you can give your front desk to say to them, if you notice anyone, because this is not breaking confidentiality, this is about age. If you're in this age cohort, then they can trigger to the nurse or to the GP a message to say, has that happened? Have we done that? Right? They can be the trigger. The other trigger for me is when you're doing the 40 to 49 at risk of diabetes. Do you know that health assessment item number? The 40 to 49 at risk of diabetes one, which is one of the uh, 703, 705, 707s under the health assessment item numbers. To do that and to be able to actually claim a diabetes at risk, they have to have done an OSDRIS tool. Is that correct? The good old OSDRIS tool. Now, some of you may not have even seen that. It's a a4 sheet of paper, basically, leaflet, and the patient fills it in and it says, how old are you, what gender you are, blah, 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 is your mother, you know, Japanese, whatever the case, and, and whatever. I'm a sitting duck, I, all the boxes get ticked for me. You then grade it in more than 12. If the score is more than 12, then the person in the 40 to 49 year old age group is at risk of diabetes. It is then that you can do a diabetic assessment on them and claim a health assessment. The ideal place for an OSDRIS tool is at the front desk. So that every time someone between 40 and 49 walks through the door, you actually hand that out. And they fill it in. It's not difficult. It doesn't take input from someone else to help you fill it in. They fill it in and then when they see the nurse or the doctor, they can hand over the completed form and it can be ascertained as to whether you need to follow through with a diabetic health assessment. So to me, the front desk is the place for that to be handed out. Why hand it out in the doctor's room, in the consulting room or with the nurse, which takes more time? You're not getting paid for filling in that bit. You're only getting paid if in actual fact you do the health assessment. So. To talk about a team approach, um, I think you've got to meet as a team. And if you are really serious about the work you're doing as nurses and as Medicare local support staff, then what you should be doing is working out team approaches to the activities within that practice. And that means sitting down and having a good old chin wag about what it is you're doing. If you listen to Stuart Constable Leadership and Tracy um, Ezad this morning, it was really interesting to hear that if you're not involved, then you probably don't give a poop. So if you don't include reception staff in what you're doing, how can you expect them to be interested in what's happening? All right? Okay. So where are the opportunities? Well, you've basically got 
if you're looking at primary health care, which we are working in, we are working in primary health care, you are often the first cab off the rank for patients to see you. They never miss the opportunity, particularly in the health promoting opportunities. And my other big thing is, please, please, please start thinking about evaluating what you're actually doing. Our friend Rianne Parker, who's presenting tomorrow, who works at um, National University, says if it ain't in print, it ain't truthful. So how do we know that what we're doing actually works? Now there actually is research to show that nurses have an influence on the reduction of HbA1c's because someone took the time to actually evaluate what they did and they got it written up. I've spoken to many nurses over the years who have undertaken a number of activities, who have done brilliant stuff and no one else knows about it. So start working with your Medicare locals and I would encourage the Medicare local staff here to start to encourage your practices to look at a little activity that you may be able to do that you can actually evaluate and get written up. One of the other research projects, which is an interesting one, is Gardasil. Is it Gardasil? Is that the jab, the 15-year-old jab, which is a 3B? Is that correct? Okay. So what happened in one of the practices that I heard about wasn't written up, was this nurse had 480 potential 15-year-olds. And what she decided to do was actually look at how many actually got the three jabs. What do you think the end result was? 45%. Now, what did she do with that information? Nothing. So we actually haven't got anything to show the benefits of the uptake of Gardasil. And yet it's supposed to be a brilliant vaccine. We might see, if you know anything about evaluation, you usually have process um, a, um, impact and outcome. The outcome will be we may see the reduction in the disease processes in 10, 15 years' time, but I won't be around to see it. It's about, a bit like Haemophilus. If anyone was around and treated and looked after Haemophilus, you know, our stats were up here until we in introduced the vaccine. And then suddenly our stats started to come down. But it took five to ten years to actually see that difference. So think about your opportunities. What is opportunistic? What needs to be strategic? What needs to be evaluated? And then think about your role and where you want to be. If you're young with young kids and you're working part-time, then for goodness sake, go with the status quo. But if you want a bit of a challenge, and you want job satisfaction, my belief is to get job satisfaction is that you actually can see that you're benefiting the people you work with. Right? So think about those opportunities. And my favourite words are, are you proactive or reactive? And particularly when I finish later, you need to be proactive if you're going to increase that rate of pay. All right? If you get the opportunity, do the leadership workshop. It's well worth doing, right? It, it, they've been running it around the state and it's very worthwhile. So give it a go. Thanks, Liz. Has anyone got any questions so far? No? Is he blowing you out of the water a bit? <laughs> Where do you see yourself sitting? Do you see yourself sitting as being proactive or reactive? Proactive, hands up. I think to be in this workshop, you're starting to look to be proactive. You're looking for opportunity. And um, I'm hoping to show you a little bit of that. Um, I'm going to actually do it in two different phases. One's actually, we're going to have a quick look at some patient files that I've got de-identified. And then we're going to have a look at some databases. So I've worked across four surgeries, so you'll see a little bit of a mix going on. And that's why. Um, so what sorts of things do you look at when you're um, opening up a patient file? They've come in for their flu shot today. What are you looking at? What are you looking for? 
allergies, yeah. Risk factors, yeah, why are they coming in for a free flu shot? There's some eligibility criteria, isn't it? So is that starting to trigger a few things? What's that part of their criteria? <coughs> they have to have a chronic, their age, yeah, over 65. Chronic condition. So what's chronic condition starting to tell you about? What sorts of things do we do for people with chronic conditions? Care plans? Yep, great. And then we could think about what sorts of chronic conditions do they have because there's lots of other opportunities out there, isn't there? Um, do they have diabetes? We do lots of things for people with diabetes. Asthma? Yeah. What do we do for asthma? Asthma cycle of care? Just that? Okay. Cycle of care. Who's doing asthma un under chronic disease 721723? Hands up those who haven't got a clue. Okay. Now, can I just interrupt? Yeah, no, there? go for it, Liz. The stuff you need to know about your item numbers is if you do an asthma cycle of Claire, exactly. how much does it pay? I'm really deaf, so please yell. About 100, Liz. Yeah. Asthma cycle of care? It's actually less than that, but it, it, it's not much, right? You do the asthma cycle of care, you've got to see the patient twice, you fill in the data, blah, blah, blah. If you do a 721, how much does that pay? Because asthma is a chronic condition, how much does that pay? 149 roughly at the moment. Then you do a review at six months, is that correct? How much does that pay? About 60. Then you can actually do one again at 12 months, is that correct? And what do we do then? We can actually probably, we may be able to do a TCA. If you do an asthma cycle of care, you can't do a GPMP. You, uh, you can, do can now, both. Bit, um, Liz, you can actually build them at the same time Sorry? as a brand new care plan. You can now at the same time as a new care plan. They'll take it through. You can with diabetes, you can't with asthma. Oh. It's an awe. It's an awe. Well, Sorry, so to... It won't get its outcome payment, is what you're saying, if you don't do the same. Well, you've got to decide what you're going to do. What is financially more beneficial? It's an, I'll stand corrected, Cathy, but yeah. recently... We've been getting them through in the last six months. So you've been doing, two a, together. You've been doing a cycle of care. But there's something care. we've missed with this, because when we do an asthma cycle of care, we do an asthma action plan. And there's yes. something essential that we need in the asthma action plan yes. that helps the patient with their education okay, and their so asthma management. Okay, so then do you do a 721? We do a 721 and a 723 usually because we send them off to the exercise physiologist for some lung, lung function and you're not improvement and the back asthma educator. And we're not getting back, knocked back, no. It's interesting because the actual descriptor says all. Hmm. The descriptor on Medicare says all. Hmm. So... Would they have another chronic disease? Because if they've got another chronic disease, you can do it. Well, they often do have yeah. another chronic disease. So, it's it, it, diabetes cycle of care, G, um, GPMP, TCAs, you can do it at the same time. You can do them. Asthma, you can't, according to the descriptor. So, I'd be interested to see... See if, why ours go through. Yeah, yeah, what goes through. All right. So... Um, what else? We've missed something here because really good <coughs> care is good funding. That's the way Medicare is set up. It's set up that if you do good care, you'll be well rewarded. So we shouldn't get too hell bent on um, actually what the item's worth, but articulating those items because every time we articulate an item, it does bring in money. So um, I think you need to be really mindful that the patients need good care. So. If we're t trying to tell someone now when your asthma is severe, your peak flow will read X, how are we going to know what their peak flow is? What have you got in your practices? Spirometry. So, yep, you'll be doing a spirometry every six months yep. as well. or when they come in. Now they've got a, on a care plan, so is that offering some support? 
care plan support if you do a spirometry on a separate occasion. Yep. So that's uh, 10997. Yep. All right. So we go I'm going to throw up a few examples now. Um, can we? Can you read that? Oh, I've been sweating on this. Liz assured me, yeah, I'll be right. Okay. We've got a 49, it says across the top, a 49-year-old male. He's a non-smoker. He's got light alcohol intake. And we can see that he's a truck driver from his occupation. Just looking at those demographics on their own, what's that telling you that you could do for this patient? An Oz risk. Mm -hmm. Great answer. Some more. How often can we do those Oz risks, by the way? Every three years. Yeah. And they have to be at least three months apart from you. The next thing that you've missed, what's another thing that we can do? 45 to 49 health check. Yeah. So it has to be at least three months gone after that. It's after an Oz risk. Mm -hmm. What else? Once, that's right. But the Oz risk is every three years between 40 to 49 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Uh, let's have a quick look at his medications. Um, I can't quite see the first one either. Um, it's a diabetic medication. Oh, okay. Avapro, Dibex. Dimicron, Parriot, Simbacort, Ventolin, and uh, uh, Simv uh, uh, Statin anyway, uh, Simvastat I think. <coughs> okay, so what's this going to tell you about this guy's history? He's only 49, isn't he? He's got a history of diabetes, asthma, sleep apnea. Hyperlipidemia. Okay. So if we go to the next slide, yeah, he's actually got, um, this is his same person, uh, except it shows the past history. So vitamin D deficiency, he's got diabetes type 2, hypercholesteremia, hypertension, gourd, uh, sleep apnea, asthma, and chronic kidney disease. Stage two, and we've got him on the yellow plan. So now I'm probably starting to speak gobbledygook. Um, but in fact, that's what our nurses are doing. So if you don't know much about chronic kidney disease, you probably need to get yourself along to a chronic kidney um, disease um, workshop or planetary. Yeah, so we're doing rolling out um, two-day workshops for chronic disease item numbers and um, for items, sorry, chronic disease um, management and um, Kidney Australia are actually doing part of that because this is very, very important because this patient with diabetes is particularly at high risk um, of worsening kidney disease but also very high cardiovascular risk um, and I'm doing a talk tomorrow on cardiovascular risk so you can come along and see how it's all tied in. Okay, so if you were doing, uh, what could you do for this patient now? Seven two one, seven two three. Do we do anything for diabetics? A diabetic assessment. Uh, it's a diabetes annual cycle of care, is that right? So there's got to be all components met in that. What are those sorts of things that we need to make sure we've got every year in a diabetes annual cycle of care. What are we looking at? HbA1c, been to the optometrist every two years, yep. Podiatrist, BMI, a home medicine review isn't actually compulsory with it, but a medication review is. Um, so when we take, speak about HMI, it's usually about the pharmacist going out to see the patient. They are great value, the patients can have them each year and that's an item 900 that might be on Liz's list. I'm trying to remember what's on your list. Okay, so you need to engage a pharmacist. We've got two pharmacists engaged for our practices. They're flat out full time looking after our patients, all right? So 
start, nurses are great networkers, pop down to your local pharmacist and find out who's doing the home medicine reviews in your area and get a good rapport going and the patients just love it. Uh, well, once the HMR comes back, then the GP discusses that with the patient and bills out a 900. Yeah. Um, don't think you can claim another one. Oh, yeah. 903 Residential Aged Care Facility HMR. Uh, it's RRMR, Residential. Medication Management Review, thank you. Uh, so um, one of our nurses, she goes out to, the, does home visits, including nursing home visits for health checks, health assessments over 75, and she will throw in a um, referral for a residential medication review. Mm -hmm. I took up the description for the 900 that you were just speaking about, and it says benefits under this item are payable not more than once in each 12 month period, except where there has been a significant change in the patient's condition oh, or medication okay. regimen requiring a new DMMR. Yes. And is it can you repeat the 900? Well, I guess so, it's yes. because it says that you can only do it once, unless, yes. except. So it's a bit like you can do a new care plan within 12 months. Um, if there's an exceptionally um, new chronic illness that needs <coughs> care, yeah. And if you say all you have to be able to back it up. And my understanding is the description of the 900 just changed, but it says that they actually have to do it in the home. Well, they already have to do it in the home. They have to do it Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, so that... So we're doing a lot of the 900s, I don't know if it's through the pharmacy, not actually going to the patient's All right. Home. Um, now, that, um, sl this slide here with the chronic kidney disease, we're actually uh, managed to set up with our, um, med uh, our uh, area health service, which is now called the district health. Mm. Uh, they're going to come to our practices and do run renal workshops because we can prove how many patients we have with stage one and stage two chronic kidney disease um, and stage three. Now, the stage fours they'll take in for private one-to-one -one education. So it's the, having that sort of data and it's the way you code it is what's really, really important. And uh, a yellow action plan actually is articulated by chronic, uh, Kidney Australia on how we manage the patients. All right, so um, what sorts of things could we have looked for? We could look for the ethnicity, uh, the lifestyle factors, the smoking, alcohol. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Liz, uh, each one of these is different, so, okay. Um, so, how many people have Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander patients? Mm -hmm. Do you know how many? And do you have them registered? You do. Have you got a system for registering the patients? You do? Who's in charge of doing that? You've got an ab Aboriginal outreach worker who does that. And how do they make sure that they're registered or encourage them to be registered to your practice? <coughs> she does the paperwork. Okay, so we proactively send out. We've, uh, we've, one of our practices has got nearly 900 um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and then we sort of go down from 500 to about 150 and 150-ish. Um, and we actually, every November, you can send out an invite to come into your centre to be registered and um, that time we book a health check. Um, and we'll follow them up on the phone too. So, um, Okay, have a look at um, if they've been a long-term smoker, you might be looking at doing some spirometry, see if they've got COPD. Um, we've got Doppler machines, um, you may or may not have Dopplers. Um, and ECGs we do on smokers um, who have been smoking more than 10 years. Um, because the guidelines tell us that patients um, have smoked or the hypertension guidelines will tell you that um, patients with hypertension should have ECGs, okay? So all of that is clearly articulated in preventative health guidelines. Um, mental health care plans, so 
we know, you'll see shortly that uh, lots of our patients have, um, with the chronic disease is quite a high prevalence of mental health illness and luckily we've got four mental, full time mental health nurses that work across the four centres, thank goodness. Um, but that might be something you need to suggest to your GPs. All right. Mm -hmm. can you run the yeah, you can actually. You okay. can. But the nurse is not doing the seven three two on the mental health. She's just doing all the seventy one. Seventy one, seventy three. Mental health is your two, seven one two. So I think. Be a two. Mental health nurse That's you right. Know. You do. You do. Yeah. Okay. Other things that you might see, as Liz has um, demonstrated as well, is the age. What do you see? I've put in 18 to 69. Well, we might want to see if they're female in 18 to 69. Pap, pap. pap smears. Good. Great. Well done. And how often are we doing those normally? Every two years. Great. Um, and the 40 to 49, quick rehash. Why, why did I say, why have I got that group there? A diabetes risk assessment. Good. So you've got your healthy kids check every time they, um, your three and a half, four year old has an immunisation, you need to be checking that. Um, Oz risk, you can build that if that comes in above 12. Now you can actually click on the computer, use the computer to do your Oz risk while they're sitting there having their immunisation and waiting your 10 minutes before you let them go. Um, you can just click it all through, all you need to do is quick tummy check and you're in. Who's doing it under the health assessment items on the 703, 705, 707? Yeah. Do you know, do you understand the difference? Yeah. That if, pardon? Yeah, so, if, so if, you, if the nurse is doing a four-year-old healthy kids check and the nurse is the only one doing it, then you can claim a 10986, which, you, which is the four-year-old healthy kids check. What does it pay? Yeah. 56 bucks. If you do it with the GP and, you, and half hours have been allocated to the nurse and the GP sees the patient for 15 minutes, we're suddenly up to a what? 705. 705 health assessment and what does that pay? 187 bucks. Mm -hmm. Now if you actually look at the descriptor for a four year old healthy kids check, I think there's a really good role for the GP to be involved unless you're an audiometrist and unless you've got really good skills in eye checking, then they're the sorts of things your GP should be doing and you can be doing all the other things that are set around the Get Set for Life book. Once again, the Get Set for Life book, the descriptor, Sammy, you've got it in front of it, still says that you're supposed to use the Get Set for Life book. Who's got them? Well, you're lucky because they're like hen's teeth. Yeah, they are. Right? They're not you available. You can download them now. Mm. But, but in actual fact, the descriptor says that you should be doing it. So make sure that when you're doing your four-year-old healthy kids check, that you document in your medical records that you've covered the items that are included in the Get Set for Life book. All right? Just document that in your medical records. And you'll be doing it anyway if you think it's about the bed wetting and fine and gross motor stuff and all of that. All right? But basically just document because at the present point in time, the descriptor still says that you should be covering those issues. All right? And, and to me, when you're starting to talk about systems, if you're doing four-year-old healthy kids checks, how are you doing them? Are you doing them opportunistically? Are you actually doing them under a clinic approach? Are you actually doing them where the nurse sees the patient for half an hour and then the doc sees them for 15 minutes? When are you actually seeing little Johnny? 3.30 on a Tuesday afternoon after he's finished preschool? Not a good time. <laughs> so these are the sorts of things where you can start thinking about systems and hold a practice approach to, to an item number. And, and people say to me, when would you be doing them, Liz? And I say, Saturday morning. Saturday morning to me is the ideal time to be doing four-year-old healthy kitchen. I don't work Saturday morning, Liz. No, but there are a lot of nurses out there who are looking for small part-time jobs and could work as a private contractor to actually do four-year-old healthy kids checks with the GP. So think about your system approach. Do you just do them? Because why have we got four-year-old healthy kids checks? Does anyone know why we've got them? 
Sorry? Exactly, because if we don't pick up kids before they go to school for their hearing particularly and their eyes, then we've got a missed opportunity. And I'm old enough to remember that we used to do kindergarten health checks. Remember the community <laughs> health nurses used to do them? Well, no one does that anymore. So unless you actually do four-year-old healthy kids check and check these kids, they're going to slip through the net. And, and I was an old community health nurse who used to do that. And I can remember, we didn't get many, but I can remember that little boy sitting in front of me and saying, I can see all those, that's right, yeah, the E goes this way, the E goes that way, the E goes there, and then doing the other eye and saying, I can't see a thing. And I said to him, now, come on. He said, no, I can't see anything, miss, can't see anything. He had a cataract, a congenital cataract. And I'll never forget his little face. I have no idea what he said. But if we hadn't picked that kid up, he could have gone through school because he'd managed. So these are the sorts of things you need to think about. Are you absolutely focused on doing all your four-year-olds or do you do them opportunistically? Have you looked at your data to pull out how many four-year-old potentials you could be doing and how many you've actually done? Because to me, it's almost criminal if you're not doing them all. And the other thing is that nurses need to be proactive and have the right <coughs> gear, the right equipment. Have your own otoscope. Have the kids' Leah uh, children's eye chart. Get, all, get yourself set up. I mean, you're professionally accountable. The Karatani website, apparently, yeah. word has it on the streets, is absolutely brilliant yeah. for the for Karatani. Uh, K-A-R-A-T-A-N-E. They, they got the contract through New South Wales Health to actually roll out the education and they've finished rolling it out. So what they've done is they've done it as an online education program. Yeah, and it's online now and it's brilliant, apparently. Okay. Just brilliant. It's because not all of us have, have worked with kids in the past, right? We've come from <coughs> all different backgrounds. And <coughs> Karatani. K-A-R-I-A-T-A-N-E. K-A-R-I-T-A-N-E. Thank yeah. you. I haven't done it. I think got told yesterday about it. I it, thought, I'm going to mention it in this workshop. It's, it's where mums used to be able to go when they were having trouble with their young bubs, you know? Mm. Okay. Now, other things that we have a quick look at is we have a look at the past medical history. And obviously, um, asthma moderate to severe is you can do your asthma cycles. <laughs> cycles, which there was a bit of debate today over. Um, have a look at coronary artery disease and you can do, what could you do for coronary artery disease? You could make sure that their pathology has been done recently. Great. Why is that? Why would we bother? Look, what are we going to look for in the pathology? Cholesterol. Okay, so if you've got a patient... Um, if you get their cholesterol down to less than four, you're actually dropping their cardiovascular risk down by 30% when you're looking at the whole approach. So it's quite um, significant to look at that. That's good. Um, has anyone got ECGs in the practice? Yeah, good. All right. So how often would you do an ECG on someone? Uh, every day. <laughs> Sorry, on a patient with coronary artery disease. Annually? Yeah, you're tied in with annually. Yep. Okay, so, and you're not sure they're on all these medications, but you don't really know. It's all gobbledygook. Um, another quick way I'd do is have a quick look at the correspondence in, and you'll find some weird specialist, <laughs> um, and uh, then you'll be able to work out what, what uh, they're asking for, and you'll often pick out a team approach. They want them to go and see a dietitian. Um, for a particular disease, like there's some rare kidney diseases that are um, high protein, and I can't think of any right off my head, but, um, uh, you know, and um, exercise regimes and things like that. The other thing is we're quite heavily involved in is um, the DVA CVC scheme. Does anyone know anything about that? There's, I've got about five people. Hands up, who's, in, who's got some gold DVA patients there? Yeah, so we've probably got about five in the room. So... That scheme is just 
tremendous for patients. I think it's something you need to have a look at if you haven't got that. And you can actually do a data search and we'll... Um, you can either do it... We'll show you shortly anyway how you can find those patients. That's right. So UPO1, you only ever bill once, and that's for registration to the scheme, and that doctors get $400, and then every three months for the ongoing registration, they get another 425 And that's physically just registered. That's called a UPO2. So every three months onwards will be a UPO2. You actually need to develop a really strict practice system with your um, clinic... Uh, reception staff, that that can be billed automatically as long as there's been some care provided by that GP or your CVC nurse. Um, the other thing is that you can run the care plans. They want them done every year, so it's a 721, 723. The patient has to have a chronic illness, um, which most of them do, even if it's um, a mental illness, it's included. And... Um, a team approach, you can build a team item and they actually want them reviewed every three months. The uh, nurse, them, they get allocated to a nurse and you usually ring them every month uh, or make contact with them, get them to pop in um, and see how they're going. The patients, initially you do a home visit um, and you basically you're popping out and identifying all their needs and um, the longer you do it, the better you'll be at it. But um, basically they can get lots of support at home from uh, an OT coming out and if the bed's too low, they're getting a new bed. If the uh, um, chair that they're sitting at's too low, they'll, they can um, get a chair. They can get a hose reel for the garden. They can get their windows washed. They can get home care. Um, lots, of, lots of benefits to it. Um, No, there's no actual item number for the phone calls themselves. Yeah, yeah, that's just built into it. Um, but the patients love it, and if you don't ring them... I've got a lot of Vietnam vets, and they like travelling. So um, if I don't ring them, they get really... Oh, you're a few days late, because I always ring them towards the end of the month, because that's how I roll. <laughs> and, um, oh, you know, I've been waiting to tell you how I'm going, or... I meant to tell you, I've run out of this script. What should I do? You know, I'm out the back of Burke and there's no pharmacists around and I'm trying to work out what I should do. And uh, So they love that. And th their families as well, the wives often will quickly get on the phone and say, no, he's been having lots of chest pain. What can we do about that? You know, is that a problem, Kath, or not? You know, so it's a fabulous system. And, you know, good care equals good funding for the... For the really obvious because they've got gold cards. No? Yep. Yeah, and it's often um, <coughs> often those who will identify it and we have the consent form up on the templates and we just the doctor chuffs one off and then it goes into my intro and then I ring them from there and organise a home visit and roll on from there. But, so, um, and don't think that they can be very old. We've got some that are eight years of age. Their dad's died in a helicopter crash. I've got some that are in their uh, mid-30s to 40s and they served in Timor and um, often came across, across some pretty nasty things and had some pretty nasty crashes before the UN went in and can tell you some real horror stories. I've got chills going through me. Um, and then I've got a lot of Vietnam vets and Korean veterans pretty well. So, broad spread. So lots of things that we can consider with, if they've got diabetes, that diabetes annual cycle care that we've talked about, ECG, we've got Doppler machines in each surgery. So we often do Dopplers um, once a year at least. Um, spirometry is always one that gets often missed with diabetics and uh, sorry, uh, asthma and COPD. Yeah, it's a really good screening tool and you get funding for it. Now, if the patient's on a care plan, what else could you bill for that if you were doing an ECG or a spirometry. What other item number? 10997, okay. Uh, my patient's Aboriginal and then I've had, I've registered them. I've gone and done the health check which was item 715 and now they've come in and I've just done an ECG what can I? What item number can I bill on that one? One zero nine eight seven. Yep. So, 
That's about $20. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One oh nine eight seven. Uh, that's um, Aboriginal healthcare support by a practice nurse. So it's not necessarily linked to a uh, care plan. They get ten of those a year. If, if they're on a care plan, yeah, they've got to have had a health check. If they're on a care plan, you've actually got those the the ten that you've done post a health assessment. But then you've got another um, one the one oh nine nine seven. How many of those can you do a year on someone on the care plan? Oh, I've just given you the answer. <laughs> so you Five. Get your back and 15 times. Yes, 15 times. Ask, but if you can. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And uh, that's not uncommon um, <coughs> when you start running nurse clinics. Okay? Uh, for a 10987, it's about $22, I think. Uh, plus, the thing is, I'm in a rural area, so we get a rural load, a 10. What's it, what is it? The bulk bill rule. 10991. And that's about $10.90, I think. So the bottom but, number is your 10990s, which is your bulk billing concession card holder down the bottom. That's for non rural areas, and your 10991 is your rural one. Yeah, that's because we bulk bill. Yeah? Everything we bulk bill. So that will that'll go in on nurse, nurse items. And then the GP items, another rural bulk bill will go in. Kathy, can I just ask, can you just tell us what the barometry items include? Um, 11506. So I have to tap it in. 11506. 11706. 11700. You'll have 15 <laughs> by the time you leave. You've got more, Lance? <laughs> Okay, and did anyone have any questions about that DVA CVC program? It really is a valuable program and I don't want you to leave without having some understanding of it. Okay. A Doppler is about $65. Um, I can't remember Doppler. So I've gone blank on the Doppler item number. That's some homework for you. Do you have Dopplers? Who's got Dopplers in their centres? Two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did a bit of homework on it and um, they soon uh, recover your funds within three, six months yeah, on the numbers we've got. 11600. Zero zero. Thanks for that. Yeah. <laughs> No, one one six one one six zero zero. One one six one zero. One zero. Okay, so have a quick look in the family history because <coughs> you might have missed an opportunity. You, you know, they might actually seem quite well, but their family history: mother's got diabetes, father's got diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease, all sorts of things you'll find in there. Uh, the past medical history: we've discussed that. Uh, check the medications and um, always think about the mental health. Now, K10 is a nice quick one to work out where they're at, the anxiety, depression scale. Does anyone know where they are in your um, programs? Is everyone on computer? You know, you make this assumption, but uh, Judy tells us like, there's like 39%, I think, that have still got some paper-based or are predominantly paper-based. So... You've got GPs that are still paper-based, yeah. Okay, so another quick one here. Uh, this one's a 75-year-old male, ex-smoker, and I just wanted to have, a, you to have a quick look at all the sorts of things that we've done for this fella. Um, he's been given dietary advice um, by our dietitian. He's um, type 2 diabetes with the doctor. Um, he's had a flu shot, he's had a care plan review, he's had a diabetes annual cycle of care, another ECG, he's had a halter monitor applied, we've got our own halter monitor service that we do for the patients um, and the, they suggest within the AF guidelines they have done every year so that you can make sure that check their rate over a 24 hour period with sleep and awake time. Um, 
care plan review, uh, driver's medical, he's done it, and a 75 health check. Do you think they've missed anything? We don't, it's hard to tell without the history, isn't it? But the, um, there's something that's really, yep, Nimavax. And I just want you to focus in on the fact that he's an ex-smoker because there's something that we missed here. Spirometry, great. Now you're thinking, now you're thinking. Okay, a three-year-old boy. Uh, obviously a non-smoker, nil alcohol, ethnicity, Aboriginal. What sorts of things could we do for this little one? <coughs> 715, yep, so we could register him. And then 715, beautiful. Um, and he's got a history of eczema, skin rashes. No, so he's pretty good. Okay. So, and what other, if he was three and a half, is there anything else we could do for him? Okay, yep, healthy kids check. And usually we use the um, GP item number for that. Okay, this little one would actually come into our, um, be monitored through our Titus Media Nurse Clinic. So we've got some funding from the Medicare local. We've got to keep an eye out for what's going on around. And we've got $6,000 and we actually bought two electronic otoscopes with that. Um, and we also bought a um, massive TV, a board table, and um, 15, 16 chairs um, with that money. So we can actually do patient education groups, staff education groups, and um, we've got these fabulous tools. The doctors will just quickly zip in with the nurses and have a look. But we're, every Tuesday afternoon, Emma runs a nurse clinic. Brings them, brings them in. Um, and sometimes she's flat out doing the rest of the family with health checks too, because the Aboriginal health checks are untimed. Okay? Unlike the other. So, and can some of. Probably you'll be aware that you probably will not get all the information for your 715 within one consult. You may have to bring them in and out. And the first one may be just about gaining trust. You know, it, it, it's, um, it's an interesting one. But, and as Cathy said, it's not time, but there's still an expectation that you undertake a number oh, of yeah, activities yeah. as per the descriptor. Hmm. <coughs> so um, if, in, if the patients get referred to anything, that she'll follow them up straight away and, and say, right, well, I'm going to ring you in a couple of weeks. I want you to come back, tell me how you got on with that specialist or Hearing Australia. Does the Aboriginal children screening for free? So I'm not sure whether you've got that down here in Victoria, but um, they do that for free. Yeah. Um, okay, so it's really important that you yeah, look at the signs and symptoms, um, document it when you're doing your preventative health thing. So an ECG, why are you doing the ECG? Have they got any symptoms at the time? Um, and you should be coding it in the medical history so, um, or in your reason for visit. Because when you want to pull up and see how many ECGs you've done, uh, you might be a bit surprised if you pull up how many you've done and how many 11506s have actually been billed. It's a quick way of checking to see whether the billing's being accurate or not. Yeah, yeah. Kate, our um, our nurse who does the home visits, she's a demon on databases and checking the billing. And she had weeks on end where she was finding good twenty, thirty thousand 30,000 each week of missed billing. Uh, so never assume, yeah, so because she sees them at home and they come b back in to see the GP on another day and they have their ECG done then. Um, sometimes, the, for whatever reason, the billing gets missed um, for the completion of that health check. Mm. Yeah, you certainly can, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I think it's 12 months you've got to claim your billing, isn't it, Liz? Thank you, because it has changed. It used to be two years, didn't it? Oh, GP has 12 months to claim it. So you've got 12 months to have a look at your databases. See, just pull up and see all, if all your health checks have been billed out. Assume nothing. Same with your diabetes, annual cycles of care. 
um, because you really can't do another diabetes annual cycle of care to 11 months after the billing occurred, not the actual care got delivered. So sometimes that can occur in different sequences where the nurses will do up the diabetes annual cycle of care while the doctor's away that day. They need to come back to have that all completed um, and reviewed. Remember? Yep. Aboriginal nine, health checks Aboriginal are every nine months, nine months. yes. Yeah. And, and the other health assessment item um, is sort of the 12 monthly, remember a 12 monthly and <laughs> one day. Going. Don't do them on the same day, they won't pay you. <coughs> <coughs> So you fill generated. out a book. How else, do, how, do, how else does everyone communicate the item numbers here? You use Praxoff, so you're on medical director and you run Praxoff separately. Who's on best practice? How do you do your billing? Oh. Yeah. So, oh, I've blanked it out, haven't I? Where they... So you keep a book of what you've done. Oh, yeah. uh -huh. We actually um, have icons that have the item number on them with uh, then the GP as well, and they're all auto done. So you could actually quickly glance at your list and you shouldn't uh, be able to see how many item numbers you've done that day. You can pull that up later, which is handy. Um, <coughs> but um, where that smaller yellow square is where you the finalise the visit, you know, tap tapping your numbers and you're just going to make sure it feeds down in items to bill and then we put in GPs, the GP's name so because when you're running six GPs you're not sure where the billing's going like you've got to be kind to your front desk staff team approach <laughs> um, and sometimes things are put on hold so you've sent, doctors said yeah you can send off a HMR we'll send it through Argus um, and that's got to stay on hold until it comes back in the patient's been seen by the GP so They'll, they'll stay on hold in the patient's file, so you would let... Good uh, team team approach with things. So you might have just done a home visit and done a 75 health check. You would put your um, 707 on hold until the patient comes back in. Um, so if it, that's... Um, that's what we can do in medical, uh, in best practice. I'm just not sure, I can't remember. I used to be on Praxoff, but I'm not that good on that now, remembering how you can. You could write it on notes, yeah. Mm hmm, okay. Yep. See, so getting good team systems approaches is the key. It's a whole team, not just one person. Um, so, yeah. okay, good communication. We've just covered that. Uh, baseline observation is really important every time you're doing an ECG or spirometry, Doppler. Um, it's getting baseline so that you can monitor any changes. Um, you need a good system for resetting reminders. So with the little ones, how do you know to get them back in a certain time? The moment we're needing to do them because the little ones, they need the two flu shots if they haven't had them before and who hasn't and who has. And <coughs> so they're all going in. Um, the spirometry... Your asthma cycle of care, that can be set from 11 months. How often can you do a new care plan? You can, can actually do them from 12 months. Yeah, um, Medicare. We've, we've got this conversation going at the moment as to whether or not you can do it from 12 months or two years because um, somebody else has come into your practice who works separately um, and they say it's two years and we were always put it to 12 months. But then it says only if they've had a significant change. So what do you classify as this? Oh, has it? Yeah, the yeah. has changed. It now says that you can do a uh, 721 every 12 months. It was two yearly. But, but I think they've changed it because everyone was doing it yeah. yearly yeah. anyway. And the DVA-CVC program, right. which is the model we're going to across yeah. Australia for chronic disease because the patient outcomes were so good, um, says 12 monthly. Yeah, mm. so. Yep. 12 months. Yeah, yep. but it was two yearly. It yep. was that you could only do the 12 monthly one if there was a change. Yeah, you know? but be careful but now, you're not too efficient with this. <coughs> if you send out your reminders at 11 months instead of 12 months, the patient's coming, you can't bill them, so everyone gets cranky. Oh, we just made an appointment. So don't, you know, be 
mindful of not sending him reminders out until after the due date. Yep. And it's a bit like the um, 732s, the reviews. You know, you, you all know that you can claim a review on a TCA and a GPMP at the same time. So that's two additional item numbers, two item numbers. And, but just remember, the review is actually only meant to be every six months. You can do it three monthly, you can, but it's supposed to have been if there's a change, right? So, the, so it would read something like, to go through the process, it would read something like that you would do a 721 and 723 today, right? And you would commence the diabetic cycle of care if they're a diabetic, right? Then in six months' time, you would do, and if that patient is aged and whatever, then you can claim, if the, if the nurse sees them and you do a ECG and a, a you know, spirometry as part of that, you can claim the 10997 as well because you've now completed it. Then at six months, you're going to do the review. You'll do the review on the 721 and on the 723, so you're going to claim two 732s, is that correct? And you will then also complete half of the diabetic cycle of care because you've got to have had two visits for the diabetic cycle of care. So you'll start to do that. And then once again, hopefully you've brought them back in between time, which you've claimed the 10997 on them, for them. Then you can bring them back again at three months and do some more 10997s. Then you bring them back at the end of 12 months and you can actually claim um, a review again if you want or you can start again and you claim the 2517. Yeah. Okay. So it should be a real cyclic approach and you should have pictures of that cyclic approach that you can undertake.